Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, SAC uh, 3280 week uh, 12, and this is the final lecture of this uh, semester. And uh, today uh, we have the second uh, guest lecture, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Lee. He's an, um, a country uh, post uh, doctoral fellow, right, uh, in uh, ANU, um, Australian National University. And he's actually a philosopher. Um, so I might want to probably ask Andrew what uh, philosophy is and also what, you know, philosopher can contribute to consciousness study and things like that uh, as a general question. But um, so he's been uh, uh, in uh, New York. Actually, you were born in New York, wasn't it? Uh, no, I just did my PhD there. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Then, uh, so he did the PhD in uh, uh, New York University um, where uh, he worked with uh, David Chalmers and Ned the Block and the Thomas Nagel, uh, each of them uh, I briefly mentioned in my lectures. And then uh, he went on to different kind of university, uh, including Oslo and also our country, uh, Australian National University, and then moved to uh, some other countries soon. And he has been now uh, working on uh, uh, various topics on consciousness from a philosophical point of view. And his uh, website uh, briefly summarizes very nicely what he's up to or his interest. The way it feels uh, to be you is different from the way it feels to be me and even more different from the way it feels to be an animal. I study basic questions about the way, why we feel, which things can feel at all, why some ways that we feel are good and others bad, and how we can become better at thinking about the ways we feel. So that's pretty, you know, right on to the question that I'm also interested in. And so it's a um, really great pleasure to um, have you, Andrew, as a guest lecturer. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, thanks now. Uh, so the description of my research that now just read is uh, it was using only words from the thousand most common English words. So if it sounded a little bit funny and basic to you, then that's why it was a little bit of a challenge to restrict the vocabulary in describing my research. And um, if I'm not restricting it, uh, as now said, I'm a philosopher of consciousness, and my main line of research is on questions about how conscious experiences are structured and also what kinds of mathematical tools we can use to model that structure. So uh, what I'm gonna to present today is um, in some ways part of that project, but also just on more general philosophical and scientific questions about consciousness. And to start off, um, I wanted to kick off with an idea that I've always thought is kind of evocative and exciting. So. Sometimes in consciousness research, you hear talk about the idea of a consciousness meter. Um, this is a device for detecting and measuring consciousness. And you know the idea is kind of seductive, right? Uh, there's so much debate about where exactly the boundary lies between creatures that are conscious and creatures that aren't, um, about whether or when we might have conscious AI systems, even about which of our own mental states are conscious or not. And you might think, if only we had a consciousness meter, then these sorts of questions would be much more tractable. Now, if we start thinking about how we would actually construct a consciousness meter, we pretty quickly run into a theoretical question. And that's the question of whether we should make the meter more like a metal detector where the outputs are binary or a food thermometer where the outputs are decreed. On the metal detector model, we put the consciousness meter next to an entity, and it either beeps if the entity is conscious or it stays silent if the entity isn't conscious. It doesn't matter how close or far you are. The point is it either beeps or it doesn't. Whereas on the food thermometer model, where the outputs are decreed, the reading of the consciousness meter tells us not only whether an entity is conscious, but also how conscious that entity is. Uh, it gives us a reading of the degree of consciousness of an entity. So we're faced with this theoretical question, uh, which of these two models is correct? Should a consciousness meter be more like a metal detector or a food thermometer? Uh, 
And this question turns on a more basic the theoretical question, and that's the question of whether consciousness comes in degrees. If the answer to this question is yes, then that means that some creatures or mental states are more conscious than other creatures or mental states. Whereas if the answer is no, then that means that these sorts of claims are either false or incoherent. And there's some people who have taken it to be obvious that the answer is yes, that consciousness does come in degrees. If you spend enough time in the consciousness world, uh, you'll occasionally hear claims like the following. A human is more conscious than a fish. A dog is more conscious than a rock. A fully awake person is more conscious than a drowsy person. A psychedelic experience is more conscious than a sober experience. And there's also many articles in both the philosophy and the science of consciousness that express sympathy for this idea, for the idea that consciousness comes in degrees. In fact, you sometimes see the idea of degrees of consciousness invoked as a starting point for constructing any empirical measure of consciousness, or as a basic constraint for mapping the structure of consciousness, even as a fundamental axiom for a theory of consciousness. But in recent years, there's also been a number of people who are more skeptical. So there are some who have contended that the idea of degrees of consciousness is dubious or even incoherent. So some have adopted what I'll call the no perspective. And these people have said things like, the notion of degrees of consciousness is of dubious coherence. If we ask, is a human more conscious than an octopus? The question barely makes sense. Uh, consciousness isn't the sort of property that can come in degrees. So we can't make sense of degrees of phenomenal consciousness. In fact, there's actually a past version of myself who might reasonably have been classified as within this no perspective. So in a short commentary paper that I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, I said, I think it's best to avoid talk of degrees of consciousness. It's not clear that we know what we're talking about when we invoke this term. Now, there's two arguments in particular against degrees of consciousness that have been especially influential in the literature. So one is what I'll call the determinacy objection. To be conscious is to have a subjective point of view, but having a subjective point of view doesn't come in degrees. And the other is what I'll call the multidimensionality objection. Consciousness is multidimensional, so the set of conscious states isn't orderable, but orderability seems to be a necessary condition for coming in degrees. So consciousness doesn't come in degrees. So I'll say much more about both of these objections in a bit. But let me stay on the big picture for a moment. The way that we answer this question matters for consciousness research, right? Because if the answer is yes, then presumably any theory of consciousness should be trying to capture its degree structure and empirical measures of consciousness should be graded rather than binary. Whereas if the answer is no, then maybe we can just abandon one of the basic theoretical assumptions that has driven a great amount of consciousness research. Maybe that long list of articles that was on the other slide, we can maybe we can just throw them in the trash. So if the skeptics are right, then a lot of consciousness research is just fundamentally confused. And again, no matter which answer is right, we can ask if we're trying to construct a consciousness meter, should it be more like a metal detector or more like a food thermometer? So that's why I'm interested in this issue. And what I'm going to do today is walk you through some of the path that I've taken in thinking about this issue uh, and to ar articulate what I now think is the correct view on this issue. And to give you a sense of where I'll be going, I'll just briefly articulate the basic idea behind what I'll argue for. So basically, I don't think either of these two perspectives fully gets things right, although I'm going to end up much more on the side of yes than the side of no. So on my view, claims about degrees of consciousness shouldn't be thought of either as obvious truths or as conceptual confusions. Instead, we should treat them as substantive hypotheses that are open to confirmation or falsification. I don't think any simple philosophical argument can either validate or invalidate these sorts of claims. Instead, I think in order to know whether consciousness comes in degrees, we need to first have a better understanding of what consciousness is.
And if you wanted to condense my view into a single slogan, it would be this. What it is to be more conscious is to have more of whatever consciousness is. And look, we don't know exactly what consciousness is yet. So we don't know yet whether some creatures can be more conscious than others. But I'll also give some reasons at the very end for thinking that most theories of consciousness entail that consciousness comes in degrees. And that's the sense in which I think the proponents of degrees of consciousness are actually closer to the truth than their skeptics. Okay, so that's where I'll be going. I'm gonna call the idea that consciousness comes in degrees, the degrees thesis. And I'm gonna think of the degrees thesis as basically synonymous with the following claims. Some entities are more conscious than others. Consciousness comes in greater or lesser extents. There are levels of consciousness. That's a term that's often used in the science of consciousness literature. Consciousness is graded. Consciousness is in order determinable. Um, a couple of clarifications. So first, the degrees thesis is a claim about phenomenal consciousness, about what it's likeness. It shouldn't be confused with the claim that there are some non-phenomenal sense of consciousness like wakefulness comes in degrees. Sometimes you see people say, look, it's obvious that consciousness comes in degrees because a fully awake person is more conscious than a sleeping person. But it's obvious that wakefulness comes in degrees. It's not obvious that phenomenal consciousness comes in degrees. It's not obvious that it makes sense to think that subjective points of view, that what is it likeness, that that comes in degrees. Second, the claim that consciousness comes in degrees shouldn't be confused with a claim that some features of consciousness come in degrees. So it's obvious that features of consciousness like intensity or vivacity or precision or complexity, those definitely come in degrees. But it's not obvious that consciousness itself comes in degrees. So as an analogy, think about how some features of trees come in degrees. For example, height, age, number of leaves. But treehood itself doesn't come in degrees. One thing can't be more tree than another. Okay, so that's just a characterization of the target question that I'm interested in. And here's what I'm going to do now for the rest of the session. Um, first, I'll return to those objections that I mentioned earlier on, and I'll explain why I think those objections don't work. And then I'll briefly articulate my positive view about what it takes for consciousness to come in degrees. That's the plan. Um, the talk is divided into three sections. And uh, now, do you prefer me to take some questions now, or should I just keep going to the end? Yeah, of... maybe uh, if you don't mind, uh, if there has been any questions so far. So. So far, it seems okay, but uh, I actually have some questions. Uh, should I? Do you want to wait until? No, go ahead. All right then. So my my question was about uh, when when you talk about this, you know, um, yes, perspective. Uh, you also talk about the orderability, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe in a couple of uh, slides ago. Yeah, orderable. Sure. Yeah, let's say on the right side. As, um, since consciousness is multidimensional, the set of conscious state isn't orderable, but orderability is a necessary condition for coming uh, in degrees. So uh, my, my question, uh, I have two questions about this. One is that, that the, it's different uh, to think about consciousness as such itself is graded or orderable or something right consciousness itself versus measure of consciousness is graded this is completely different things and your um starting point of that uh in today's talk was about sort of a measure of consciousness which is like binary or you know degree kind of things and that's definitely something that is always orderable but uh, consciousness as such is uh potentially not so uh, am I understanding uh, correctly about this distinction first? Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point. And okay. I think 
you're right that we should make that distinction. I can say more about uh, what, did you have more to your question or should I just go ahead and respond? No, you just go ahead first. It, yeah, well, basically I, 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 I just agree. I think that we should make that distinction that uh, having a degree measure doesn't necessarily entail that the thing being measured is itself degree. Mm -hmm. The primary focus that I'm going to be um, concerned with in this talk is about degrees of consciousness itself, as opposed mm -hmm. to degrees of our measures of consciousness. Mm -hmm. When I brought up the idea of a consciousness meter, I mean, that's more meant to um, be a way of illustrating mm -hmm. the interest of this issue. Mm -hmm. If we were thinking about an idealized consciousness meter, presumably mm -hmm. we'd want the structure of the outputs of that meter to match mm -hmm. the structure of the thing mm -hmm. being measured. So that's sort of what I'm thinking about in this slide. But I totally okay. agree that even mm -hmm. if you think that consciousness is not degree, you mm -hmm. might still think that in some cases it'll be useful to have a degree measure. Now, in those cases, there's an important question, what is the interpretation of mm -hmm. the different degrees in the measure? Like, is it just that, uh, is it something like degree of confidence that we have that the creature being measured is conscious or mm -hmm. is it something else? So I think mm -hmm. in that case, we still need to say something about um, you know, what the degrees actually mean. Um, but basically, I, I think you're right, and that's something that it, it's important to be sensitive to. Okay. Then the second question uh, is that I noticed that I'm categorized as yes perspective uh, uh, person, right? In one of the slides here. Uh, yes, here. Here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in this paper, we... I don't know whether uh, what what do you take about this, but uh, we gave an example of the comparison of the let's say best baseball player and the best soccer player in the world, and then can we make an order between them? That's something that I think it's similar to the question of ordering of the conscious states of the, you know, anesthesia versus sleep or something like that, that cannot be directly compared. But within baseball player, you know, of course there is an amateur baseball player. And so for the soccer player, you know, we also have, you know, amateur soccer player and somebody who just cannot play any, you know, uh, sport at all. And then within this, you know, line, some dimensions we can kind of compare, but not always, uh, you know, all the combination of the things can be compared directly. And that's the kind of mathematical notion of pre-order, right? Any given two things may be compared, but maybe not compared. Mm -hmm. and is it sort of, you know, similar to this kind of perspective or not in your opinion? Here, um... I think what I want to say is let's just wait till I go further in the talk okay. because I think that'll right. clarify how I'm thinking about these sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. I think that some of what you're expressing will be connected to my response to the multidimensionality objection. Mm -hmm. um, so let's wait till we get to that point. Okay, uh, okay. At least. All right, all right, all right. Uh, okay, so, so far, uh, is there any other question? By the way, I should also point out that uh, if you haven't checked, uh, there is a uh, handout that I distributed already to uh, in here uh, to the class. But uh, Andrew uh, prefers uh, for you to stay stay focused on the slides during the lecture. Okay, so um, okay, let's go. Okay, so. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll now go to the second section, and then uh, maybe after that, we can have a break or more Q&A. So basically, what I want to do now is discuss the main objections to degrees of consciousness that have occurred in the literature, and why I don't think those objections work. So if you look at the literature on uh, this topic, there's one paper that stands out in terms of its impact. That's this paper from 2016 by 
Bain, Hoey, and Owen called Are There Levels of Consciousness? And they say the following to characterize the target of their criticism. They say, this idea of degrees of consciousness is frequently expressed in consciousness science. For example, consciousness is described as involving a scale ranging from total unconsciousness to vivid wakefulness as a continuous variable and as being graded rather than being an all or none property. And individuals as ordered on the basis of how conscious they are. So that's them just specifying the view that they're talking about. And then they go on and criticize this view. They say, the notion of degrees of consciousness is of dubious coherence. According to the standard conception of consciousness, a creature is conscious if and only if it possesses a subjective point of view. Arguably, the property of having a subjective point of view is not gradable. It cannot come in degrees. So basically, they're expressing a version of what I'm calling the determinacy objection. They're saying an entity either is conscious or not. There is no middle ground. Even if that entity has only a sliver of feeling, that entity still counts as being conscious. So therefore, it doesn't make sense to say that consciousness comes in degrees. Now, when I first encountered this argument, I found it fairly compelling. Uh, I mean, that's partly why I wrote that short commentary paper against degrees of consciousness uh, I mentioned at the beginning. But I started thinking about this more, and I realized there has to be something wrong with this argument. And that's because we can construct structurally analogous arguments with the same inferential patterns, but with obviously false conclusions. So here's an example. Think about this absurd argument about size. An entity either has size or not. There is no middle ground. Even if, entity, if an entity occupies only a tiny region of space, that entity still counts as having size. So therefore, it doesn't make sense to say that size comes in degrees. So obviously this argument doesn't work. The conclusion is false, but the inferential structure of the argument is the same as that for the determinacy objection. So that means that there has to be something wrong with the inferential structure of the determinacy objection. And there's nothing special about size here. You could substitute in other degree properties like mass or velocity or temperature to make similar points. Okay, so then, what exactly has gone wrong with this argument? Well, here's my diagnosis. I think that the determinacy objection is basically confusing two distinct questions. One is the question of whether a property, let's call it F, comes in degrees. If it does, then let's say it's degreed. If not, let's call that property dichotomous. The other question is whether it can be a matter of degree, whether some entity is F. If so, let's say that F is indeterminate, and if not, it's determinate. And it's easy to see that these are two distinct dimensions when we consider examples that fill in each of the four possibilities in this table. So for example, think about mass. It's not a matter of degree whether something has mass. Everything either has mass or it doesn't. You know, material objects have mass, but the number three doesn't have mass. The color red doesn't have mass. Yet it's still the case that mass comes in degrees. Some things have more mass than others. Or think about being a quark. So it's not a matter of degree whether something is a quark. Everything either is or isn't a quark. And quark could, doesn't come in degrees. One thing can't be more quark than another. On the other hand, think about warmness. It is a matter of degree whether something is warm. So lukewarm is borderline warm. And warmness also comes in degrees. Some things are warmer than others. And then finally, think about being a tree. It's a matter of degree whether something is a tree, but treehood doesn't come in degrees. One thing can't be more tree than another. Another, another way to see this point is with a visual illustration. So you could imagine a world where every entity is either determinately conscious or determinately not conscious. Yet, you could still think in such a world that consciousness comes in degrees. Maybe humans are more conscious than fish and alpha centurions are more conscious than humans. So what this is illustrating is that degrees and indeterminacy are distinct from each other. And one thing you could think is that maybe indeterminacy itself involves some kind of degree structure. And maybe that's right. Um, that depends on more far off philosophical questions about the nature of indeterminacy and the nature of vagueness. But even if we assume that, this, this distinction that I'm articulating is still going to hold. 
And that's because when we're talking about indeterminacy, we're talking about the degree to which something has a property or the degree to which something falls under the extension of a property. Whereas when we're talking about degrees, what we're talking about is the structure of the property itself. And I think this distinction is important for consciousness research. I think the conflation between indeterminacy and degrees generates a lot of confusion in the consciousness literature. Because if you look, some work that talks of degrees of consciousness is focused on indeterminacy. And other work that talks of degrees of consciousness is focused on degrees. And that would be fine if the literatures themselves were appropriately divided, but that's not the case. There are articles that are on one issue that draw upon or criticize arguments that are, are about the other issue. And usually there's no indication that these issues are distinct from each other. And in most cases, degrees and indeterminacy are just treated interchangeably, interchangeably which leaves it open, you know, which issue is really at stake or which arguments are, are really relevant. Okay, so that's the first objection. That's what I think goes awry there. So let's turn to the second objection, the multidimensionality objection. Since consciousness is multidimensional, the set of conscious states isn't orderable, but orderability is a necessary condition for coming in degrees. Um, here's an expression of that objection from the paper I mentioned before. Although the idea of degrees of consciousness entails that one conscious state must be absolutely higher than another conscious state, we see no reason to grant that claim. The conscious state associated with REM sleep might be higher than that associated with sedation on some dimensions, whereas the opposite might be the case on other dimensions. So we have this diagram here meant to illustrate this point. And the idea is that maybe there are eight different dimensions of consciousness. And here we have the representation of two different conscious states, one associated with dreaming, the other associated with sedation. And maybe the sedation state is higher on dimensions one, two, three, and four, whereas the dreaming state is higher on dimensions five, seven, and eight. And if that's the situation, then we just can't say that dreaming is more conscious than sedation or vice versa. Um, instead, the idea is that we should adopt this more nuanced multidimensional analysis. Okay, so that's an expression of the multidimensionality objection. And to develop my... Um, criticism of this objection. I made a diagram of my own. So my diagram illustrates sizes of different fruit. We have four fruit here, blueberry, apple, banana, and watermelon. And this diagram represents the relative lengths and widths of these fruits. So blueberry is really small, apple and banana are in the middle, watermelon is really big. Okay, so let me make three points with this diagram. First, size is multidimensional. Its dimensions are length, width, and depth. That's um, basically uncontestable. Second point, some pairs of sized objects aren't orderable in the very same sense in which some pairs of conscious states might not be orderable. So if you think about apple and banana, it's not the case that either apple is bigger than banana or banana is bigger than apple because the apple is wider, but the banana is longer. And third observation, size still comes in degrees. Watermelon is just bigger than apple, which is bigger than blueberry. So those are all pretty obvious observations. But I think these observations show that there's something that's going awry with the multidimensionality objection. It shows that just because a property is multidimensional and hence not totally orderable, that doesn't mean that the property doesn't come in degrees. So here's a way of uh, making the multidimensionality objection a little bit more explicit. This is the basic reasoning behind the objection. Premise one, consciousness is multidimensional. Premise two, if consciousness is multidimensional, then the set of conscious states isn't orderable. And premise three, if the set of conscious states isn't orderable, then consciousness doesn't come in degrees. So conclusion, consciousness doesn't come in degrees. So I think there's basically two things that are going wrong here. One is that I think there's equivocation on the term orderable. Um, because by orderable, we might mean either totally orderable, meaning that when we have a set, any two elements can be compared with respect to the relevant ordering relation. 
or it might mean just partially orderable where some elements are incomparable with respect to the ordering relation, even though other pairs of elements are comparable. So if by orderable, we mean totally orderable, then we're going to get the result that uh, premise two is plausible. Multidimensionality does seem to imply a lack of total orderability. Think about like the sizes of fruit. But premise three is going to be false because just because the set of conscious states isn't orderable doesn't mean that consciousness doesn't come in degrees. Um, total orderability isn't a requirement for being degree. Think about size. On the other hand, if orderable means just partially orderable, then we're going to get the result that premise three is plausible. Any degree property has to have some at least partial ordering. But premise two is going to be false because multidimensionality is compatible with partial orderability. So that, I think, is the core flaw in the ordering objection. I also think, though, that premise one is actually also unobvious. So what is obvious is that conscious states vary along many dimensions. But I don't think it's obvious that consciousness itself is multidimensional. So here's an analogy. Think about mass. Objects with mass vary along all sorts of dimensions. Uh, shape, color, material, composition, and so forth. But mass itself is multi is unidimensional. The only dimension of mass is mass itself. By contrast, think about size. Size itself is multidimensional. Its dimensions are length, width, and depth. And again, the set of sized objects um, varies along all sorts of dimensions. So we could ask, is consciousness more like mass or is it more like size in this respect? I mean, everybody agrees that conscious experiences vary, on, vary in all sorts of ways, but it's not obvious what we should think about the dimensions of consciousness itself. And what the ordering objection is doing is assuming that consciousness is more like size or more like health or more like other kinds of multidimensional properties. But that premise really requires a lot more argument. And to my knowledge, nobody has really examined this systematically in the consciousness literature. By the way, this is a question that I've been thinking more about recently, uh, about whether consciousness is in fact multidimensional or not. And my current hypothesis is that consciousness is either zero dimensional or infinite dimensional or somewhere in between. Um, so I'm still working on, on this issue. Okay, so that's the multidimensionality objection. Um, there's another objection that I usually discuss in this talk about what it's like expressions. Um, I won't discuss this objection. The objection is that when you, everybody um, knows that what we mean by saying that something is conscious is to say that there's something it's like to be that thing. But when you think about degree modifications of what it's like sentences, they sound funny. For example, you can't say there's something it's like to be Plato more than there's something it's like to be Aristotle, or what it's like to be Kant is more than what it's like to be Hume. I'm just going to skip this because it's going more into things that I think will be of interest mostly just to philosophers than uh, connections to um, the science of consciousness. But I'm happy to discuss that more if, if people want. So that's my response to the objections. And Basically, what I've done so far is I've defended the conceptual coherence of degrees of consciousness, but I still haven't really said anything yet about what exactly it would mean for consciousness to come in degrees or how we can actually assess whether that's the case. So what I'm going to do for the last section of the talk is I'm going to first develop a positive analysis of what it would be for consciousness to come in degrees, and then I'm going to show how the analysis applies to some theories of consciousness. Should we pause here? Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's a good probably uh, timing to uh, take a break. Uh, I'll have a, so uh, student, um, or uh, if you have any question, uh, you can post it on chat or you can ponder uh, during the break and uh, we'll come back in four minutes. Uh, so can I share the screen? Uh, yeah, should I stop screen? Yeah, yeah. 